And up next, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, Mr. Lucas Soko, Head of Master Planning Master City on sharing of topic, Master City's innovation ecosystem, technology as an enabler to realizing sustainable and human-centric urban development. Let's put our hands together to welcome Lucas on stage. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to also thank every one of you who actually are still here in the room sharing all these uh, very exciting initiatives. Uh, I'd like to also thank Cyberport, the Hong Kong government, uh, for having me here and sharing all the work that we've been doing at uh, Mazdar City uh, in the UAE. So we have this promise that uh, with technology, you can do anything. And surely this morning, I think we've seen a lot of that, that, that that truly is possible. I think the fundamental question we as a society is what should we have technology do for us? So in 2006, the Abu Dhabi government launched the Mazdar Initiative. Now this is important to say, this is 2006. This is at the peak of real estate development internationally. But the UAE took a step back and wanted to see, is there perhaps a better way that we can also do this? The focus was on clean technology, innovation and research, and ultimately the implementation of these new societies. For those who may not be as familiar with the UAE, uh, Abu Dhabi, its capital, is about an hour's drive um, from Dubai, and Mazdar City, highlighted here, is situated right next to its airport, providing a great gateway uh, to the world. It's also next to the new governmental capital called Zayed City, as well as many attractions and our uh, neighbors in uh, Yas Island, where we host uh, several exciting events. So this is the vision of Mazdar. I've seen uh, from Hefei City some amazing giant cities. We're a little bit more uh, downscale to that, to that size. We're about six square kilometers, uh, about 3.7 million square meters of development of mixed use um, community. Essentially half residential with the rest uh, uh, commercial. This gives rise to about 15,000 people who currently live and work here. Ultimately, uh, it will be around 90,000 people. We have about 1,000 uh, companies who are very quickly accelerating and, and growing with us within the uh, Mazdar City Free Zone. Uh, we like to consider ourselves also a gateway to the Middle East, very much like uh, Hong Kong, perhaps, is the gateway to China and Asia. So Mazdar City is a pioneering development, looking at the way that we can build better, more sustainable communities and really transforming the way people live, work, play, and learn in a way to provide more nourishing and uh, meaningful lives. Uh, we are very proud to host over 400 delegations from around the world um, annually. But one of the fundamental questions that we always get asked by the esteemed uh, uh, politicians and, and uh, planners and, and technologists is, okay, I have an idea as well, but how do I transform that into reality? What is that course for implementation? So we do this through a sustainable ecosystem. Now, you've heard ecosystem mentioned here several times this morning. I think it's absolutely critical because it's essentially a system of systems, right? Which leads to the next word, which is connectivity. All these systems are interconnected, just like people are. So if you're talking about tech, you're talking about the natural environment, you're talking about the human environment. So there's the traditional three pillars of sustainability being environmental, which for us translates into the physical built environment and is our physical capital, one that we also have to manage. Then there's the social sustainability. We have to ensure that we have good amenities to ensure a high quality of life so we can attract talent 
to actually fuel our growth and innovation. Of course, there's economic uh, sustainability in the free zone business ecosystem, which, which brings in financial capital and ensures that we have uh, uh, enough flow to continue with the development, with growth, and ultimately uh, allowing people to uh, live. Now, I've seen uh, uh, this morning many of the politicians speak with, with high aspirations that I think are right on target. I think it's a, it's, it's a pleasure having so many like-minded people here today. Uh, but it's because it's really them responding to their people and setting those vision and goals into how to achieve this uh, new model for living. Um, the goals that we've set are uh, uh, energy efficiency, we have a 40% reduction from the ASHRAE standard, which is kind of the uh, US-based uh, standard that we've applied. Uh, we enforce that with Mazdar um, energy design guidelines, and then we also monitor that. And I'll, and I'll show you how we do that in, in just a second. Uh, water use as well. Water being in the Middle East is a, is a critical resource for us. Uh, we have to desalinate most of our water, which means it also leads to energy um, use. So it's a critical focus for us um, and we try to minimize water use as less than two square meters um, a day. And of course also waste management is critical, looking at that comprehensive life cycle of building and construction. Uh, waste management, we divert a minimum of 70% uh, from the landfill. Um, we usually actually try to target about 90%. And some of this is, is very simple. It's actually prompted new industries to develop, is crushed concrete used for future roadbeds as, as, um, as we develop. The hot topic, of course, uh, uh, is embodied carbon. So we have a 20% reduction in the overall construction of steel structured buildings and a 30% reduction in the overall construction for concrete and structured um, uh, buildings. Now this is critical. Uh, in terms of sustainability, one of the most important things is we're always looking at being efficient, right? But the best is if you actually don't have to even use the material itself. So really it's deciding when do you need to build, what do you need to build, and then how do you need to build it. Is there perhaps a new way of, uh, of doing things? So I think uh, we've all been talking about technology. Of course, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the Digital Economy Summit here. Um, but it's really quite simple. The application of knowledge, uh, the technology is the application of knowledge to the practical aims of human life. So it always comes full circle, right? We're all doing this in order to help ourselves live um, better lives. So it's a means to an end. It's not the end itself. That's why the question of what we want to do with this technology is so critical. This is one of my favorite diagrams. Um, I lecture at several universities, and this is always what I show students because it kind of transforms the way that they think about it as designers. Right? So I said technology is a way that we can transform our environment. Right? But we must remember that we have a history of technology. Right? We've been using technology for thousands of years. So it's also about not forgetting the technologies that we've learned uh, in the past. Of course, at the peak there, we all love to see um, um, a photovoltaics, power generation in, in new ways um, that's, that's cleaner. But actually, to achieve efficiency, some of the biggest impacts you can have are actually at that bottom, right? These are passive measures. So the width of that pyramid at the bottom is actually showing overall impact. So this is something that we embed in Mazdar, um, um, particularly orientation of buildings, making sure you do windows in the right place, making sure that you're working with the environment as opposed to against it can help you a long way down the road. It can really set you up into being much more sustainable. So let me, tell, let me show you a little bit of how we do that. Um, in order to, uh, to 
demonstrate and actually measure using several technologies uh, developed uh, by our partners. We use several accreditation methods. Um, of course, LEED is, is, a, is a more or less an international standard from the US, but it's also been translated into Estadama, which is uh, Abu Dhabi's uh, sustainability program. It's based on LEED, but it's tailored for the location, which has a little bit different challenges than you'll find in North America, particularly the water challenge uh, I mentioned before. We're looking at zero energy. Of course, and I'll actually show you some buildings that have achieved that. And we're also focusing on well. Does it, has anybody heard of well before? This is an interesting one because, again, it goes back to people. So you can think about it as kind of like sustainability in the indoors, making sure that people are in comfortable environments that don't have chemical off-gassing from, let's say, glues and, and, and materials that aren't uh, beneficial, that there's daylight coming through. And this has been shown to actually have people become much more healthy and more productive to their businesses. And the one I don't have on here is actually the wired score as well, which is uh, directly rating buildings to show how um, adaptable they are to future technologies. So as I showed in that pyramid, there's passive measures that can be applied. Um, the ones we've applied in Mazdar are first, solar orientation. So making sure that we use buildings to actually shade one another so we have minimum heat gain on the buildings themselves. Typically, in architecture, you would want that to be an east to west orientation. But that's if you're only doing a building. If you're doing urbanism, it's actually much better to orient it a little bit so that all your pathways remain shaded. And that's actually one of the images there. The other one is, excuse me, the other one is wind flow orientation. So we want to maximize wind flow through the city. It allows for a much more uh, comfortable microclimate and allows people to contribute to walkability. The other one, the, the, the large square on the right, actually represents our density. So the light yellow is if we developed in a low density uh, a configuration, much like uh, um, would happen in a traditional context. But what we've done is we've crunched it down to about one ninth of that, and of course in Hong Kong here you've gone much higher than that, so your efficiencies are actually uh, much higher. Um, but we've gone to one ninth, which allows for much more walkability because everything is closer together. It of course also reduces significantly the amount of infrastructure that has to be built. But the important thing is, although I was talking about how we work with our infrastructure and buildings, all of this has a fundamental impact on human beings walking within the public realm environments of Mazdar City. And so some of those impacts is, this is a Abu Dhabi downtown, so this is our CBD um, on the island. And you can see the, this is kind of a temperature in the summer, it does get quite hot there, about 37 degrees. Mazdar City, the ambient temperature is actually a little bit higher because we're not right on the coast. So we actually have a little bit higher temperature to deal with, so our challenge is also higher. But our radiant temperature, what people actually feel, is about 37. Now we've measured this, and you can see the impact is actually much greater. So many of you have maybe heard of the heat island effect, which is depending on which materials you use, you can see the asphalt here gets quite hot, up to 57 degrees. So you can imagine what walking on asphalt at 57 degrees can do. Meanwhile, with the densities pushing the buildings closer together, actually using shading above, including PVs that can also not only shade the city but generate power, that takes the brunt of the heat. So our PVs, our photovoltaics, still get to about 55 degrees, but they're not within the public realm or the human environment. Instead, they're generating electricity for the buildings below, where our ground is only 33. So it's, it's about a, let's say, up to 10 degree difference. Now all this is passive. 
This isn't us channeling cold air into, into these passages. This is just which way we orient the, uh, orient the buildings to block the sun and allow the breezes to come through and make sure we have a shaded and well-ventilated environment. Now, how do we what are some of the technologies that we use to uh, manage planning and development within the city? So we've built our own platform and built our own platform to, uh, is really based on, we used several technologies from experts, expert companies in the BIM, <coughs> excuse me, in the BIM and GIS realm, mainly Esri and Autodesk, but combined them and simplified them. So this isn't anything that you wouldn't see anywhere else. This is essentially Mostar City with the land use colors, yellow being um, uh, residential, uh, with red being uh, kind of commercial and mixed use. The difference is it's very easy to use. So we still have our GIS environment with GIS managers that run and operate very technically uh, complicated apps. And we still have our BIM managers looking at the architectural side who can do scheduling and all kinds of me measurement as well. But those are essentially like 2% of the employees. Whereas this is targeted at 95% of the employees. So this is doing a little bit of reverse. We took very high tech, very capable technologies that we still use in-house, but we also scaled them down in a very user-friendly way so they're more accessible to everybody else. Because we really believe it's not necessarily about bringing technology to power, it's about empowering people with technology. Now the testament uh, to the success of this that I've received is the finance department um, complained. I said, what, what's, what's the matter? And they said, why don't we have access to this? And we didn't, we said, well, we didn't realize, why would you want to access to this? It's like, well, it's really important for us because we actually manage a lot of these plots and we need to see when we have contracts coming up so we can see where vacancies are coming. And, and then they started saying all these business cases that we never thought of as planners but in their finance side, it makes a lot of sense. And the only reason that was possible is because the adoption rate with the simplified version was so high because it was easy for them to use and adapt to their daily tasks. So sometimes it's about simplification of very advanced technologies and actually making them accessible um, to general employees. Another feature of this is, uh, this is a little bit unique, our resolution of our aerial is one centimeter, right? So this was done with drones flying around the city, doing digital mapping, uh, doing essentially building a digital twin. But what you can see is all of a sudden this created complete new user cases for our facilities management team. Because all of a sudden you can actually see manholes. You can actually see these assets without having to spend time going out and making sure and measuring and doing things like that. For our events teams, they can now quickly measure a little area, see if they can hold an event if something uh, uh, fits in there. Um, this also then translates, of course, into a 3D model. Now, this has existed for years, but again, it's the simplification of this. I actually have this application on my phone that was very easily ported from the um, um, Esri uh, uh, platform. The difference here is we are able to directly introduce our BIM models as well. So this is a project that's under construction now, and you can see exactly how it's gonna, how it's gonna fit in there. And over that, we can also overlay all our planning data and information. So again, that land use map you saw at the beginning, again, it's very simple. Those plots extruded, but they're extruded to the actual uh, limited heights for development. So what that means now, instantly, anybody without having to be an expert needing to go through technical drawings can understand, oh, you know, something, something is not following the rule here. What happened? There's a building poking through, all right? It's like, oh, yes, but that's not an occupiable space, so it actually doesn't have to follow that regulation. That's actually one of our passive wind towers, which is a traditional form called a bergil in the Middle East. 
Let me show you another example of how we do design um, in our public realm projects. Uh, the photo here is actually um, just during an opening of one of our recent parks about a month ago. So we looked at Eco Plaza, where we did what we like to call science-based design. We realized that we had some heating um, challenges there, and the park wasn't as comfortable throughout most of the day as we would like. So we worked with uh, part, some of our partners within our ecosystem. So these are companies who used um, uh, our Catalyst, which is one of our platforms, and also Hub71, which is uh, another um, um, uh, incubator within Abu Dhabi. And they actually mapped all of Mustar City for temperatures throughout the day. The important thing is we were able to get temperatures at various times of day. So just flicking through, which allowed us to then figure out exactly which pavers are performing how, the impact of, uh, of trees, and then actually do a mitigation measure using those, uh, that information to the design team to create a more uh, um, uh, comfortable environment. So that's part of the social sustainability. Now I see uh, I'm, I'm slowly running out of time. I only have a couple minutes left. But uh, I do want to say, talk a little bit about architecture because of course that's a big impact. Um, so our target was 40% energy reduction. We've actually achieved 38%, which is in practical use. So the 40% is design, using technology to model the buildings that, that we're constructing. The 38.4% is actually in practice which uh, for those who are within the industry is very high. Usually that number is about in the 20s because you can't really predict human behavior that well yet. So we're well above the industry standard um, there. Um, we're generating almost 40% of uh, clean energy and of course almost 30% water reduction as well. So here's uh, some of our journey. And it has been a journey, it's important to say, because it's not just about being able to design and envision these things, it's about implementing them, which requires industry development, right? Because there were materials that weren't available. The construction companies did not necessarily have the skilled labor in order to build in these new means. So this was our journey. And you can see right around 2017 was our first uh, uh, net zero project, which was a, a villa which was critical, but now we're actually delivering much larger building infrastructure. Our first office building was 102% in 23, and we have two more projects under construction, an HQ building as well as a co-working uh, building, which is part of our um, innovation startup. And now I'd like to show you how we actually uh, uh, measure the performance of these buildings through our smart center. This is actually live data that's integrated within an IoT system with all the sensors uh, within the building. And, and it's actually a control center as well because you are able to mechanically operate these. Of course, the next stage for us is to look at uh, um, applying that uh, um, to AI so you can even more accurately operate that. So we are a comprehensive ecosystem starting from uh, startups with our Catalyst platform all the way uh, into uh, uh, quite large companies. You can see um, some that you would recognize here as well, including the academic sector, which is critical for us. We are a free zone, so anyone who's interested is welcome to uh, have their uh, access into the Middle East through Mustar City, where you can wholly own uh, your company. Um, and actually have access also to uh, several uh, government initiatives to help uh, fund and build your startup as well. Here are some of our um, partners. And this is how we are addressing with these partners, because it really is an ecosystem. We, although we may know some theory about development and planning and, and architectural design and public realm, 
There's the private sector who's taking care of, of a lot of that, uh, much better than, than we could ever. Uh, so we have six fundamental growth sectors. And here's a couple of highlights of, uh, of an energy cluster from, from Mazdar Energy, which is building about 20 gigawatts of renewable energy internationally. Savi Cluster, which is our smart autonomous um, uh, vehicles industry, which is looking at smart mobilities, which we've done multiple generations of. Um, green Hydrogen. This is one of the first stations in the, in the UAE providing green hydrogen uh, to vehicles, AI and R&D. There's actually two large language models that are Arabic-based that came out of Mostar City. And life science and biotech. Again, you may recognize uh, some companies here also based in China. So thank you. Again, I ask uh, with technology, you can do anything. And really, it's the people like we have in this room. What will you do with technology? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucas, for sharing with us your experience.